Good morning. The Chickles, a country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Wow! I need to do that again. That worked <laughs> awesome. That Man, great. I didn't even say anything. How polite! Why are y'all being so good to me today? <laughs> Y'all are having mercy on me because you know who's not here. <laughs> Can you believe him and his wife went to College Station? I can't think of a, I can't think of a good reason to go to College Station. Who would go there? His daughter's a granddaughter's a vet. That's why he went there. If you have your copy of Scripture. David's text, the Lord's led him to, is in Luke chapter 10, or chapter 11, rather. Uh, the first 13 verses, Luke writes, and he says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is uh, in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is shut, and my children are with me in bed. I can't rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, for this text to remind us the importance of prayer in our walk with you. And Lord, I want to pray for your blessing on your word. Pray for your blessing on our worship time as David leads us in praise and worship. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Would you turn to two or three people around you? They may not know your first name, so tell them your first name so they'll know who they're worshiping with today.
y'all are going to be tired of seeing me today. <laughs> well, I hope that's why we're here today, is to give him glory, right? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the glorious Lord Jesus and for what he means to us and for the salvation that he's provided and is offered to all who will receive him. Father, we've gathered here today for no other reason than to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we want to invite and welcome your Holy Spirit here among us to move freely and work in each of our lives. Father, I just pray that everything that we do and say and sing, uh, preach, Father, that it brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll give you all of the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Uh, it's my privilege to get to welcome this morning in our pastor's absence, and so uh, if you're a guest here for the first time or maybe a second time and you haven't filled out a guest card, if you would raise your hand just long enough for one of these men to get some information to you, we're not going to embarrass you, uh, we just want to give you some information about our church, uh, and in that packet, you'll have there'll be a guest card, we'd ask that you please fill that card out. Uh, and place it in one of the boxes as you exit the worship center this morning. Uh, it's always encouraging to us to see who we had with us in worship. And by the way, that is your offering today. You just place that in the back. And uh, the, the giving is for the regular attenders and, and the members here to return the Lord's tithes and our offerings. So we don't ask anything of you. So we glad, we're glad that you're here and welcome you to worship with us. Uh, since I'm filling in for Butch, I have a lot of notes here. <laughs> yeah, I thought with me being out that maybe they wouldn't come, but they still come. That's okay. Mike Dossett tomorrow, 75. Where's he at? He, he doesn't look a day older than 90 to me. And let's see. <laughs> Well, I wasn't prepared for feedback. Uh, Wayne Nelson, 77th birthday. We're at, where you at, Wayne? 77. Wow. That is great. And Carl and Della Lee celebrated their 68th wedding anniversary on Friday. That's like twice as long as I've been married. I mean, that is awesome. What, a, what an encouragement that is. Uh, so let's enter into a time of worship, and Dave's up. Thanks, sir. <laughs>
precious blood he shed for me is my
I humble myself before you. Lord, I lay all that I am at your feet. Lord, I humble myself before you. Come fill me now with your wisdom, love, and power. Not your loving hand to guide me, I need you. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Isn't that the cry of our heart? I need you, Lord. Hmm. 
Well, if you're visiting today, I'm not Butch Eichels. Um, um, Brother Butch celebrated a birthday on Thursday and so is enjoying some time with his bride and family. Um, and I am echoing, so y'all can, uh, you got it? Okay, there you go. Um, this weekend, uh, the Country Church Men, we, uh, we headed over to San Marcos for the Calvary Men's Conference, and uh, that was an amazing time together. It's something when you get, I mean, I love on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, when we get this crowd here lifting up our voices in praise, but can I just say there's something about when you get men huddled together in a room and they'll sing all praise to God. It's a pretty powerful thing when you when you hear men lifting their voices in praise. We had an, a great time. There were two speakers, um, Alan Stoddard and Steve Cochran, and um, just share a couple of things they said because I think they're real timely to us. Um, one of the things that Steve said was, we often decide to live with sin rather than repenting of sin. Yeah, ouch, yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of how the men said amen there, <laughs> ouch. Steve also gave a definition of faith and he couldn't give credit to where it came from because he didn't remember where it came from. But he said, faith can be defined as confident obedience to the word of God, regardless of consequences or circumstances. Alan, who is on a one-man crusade to keep the ponytail with men, I love that brother. He, he's just, he's just, I, I mean, he just loves Jesus and just oozes Jesus and um, he challenged us, he, he said, become men who are discontent with the status quo so much that you are willing to take that next step of faith. In other words, don't just complain about what's going on. Be willing to take a risk and follow the Lord. Your step of faith he was saying this in the context of even if you fail, how many of you ever tried to follow the Lord, you tried to take a step of faith and you ended up doing like Simon Peter and sinking instead of walking? Uh, he said, your step of faith might encourage someone else to take their own step of faith. thought that was good. And that was specifically for one of our brothers who was, who was present. And then this, this last little quip from, from the conference, time is not on our side. Time is not on our side unless you know the clockmaker. Yeah, that was good. That was good. So we had an incredible time, men. If you, uh, we go to this thing every year annually. So in August, just kind of be thinking that way because we have an incredible time Together Now today we're headed into Luke chapter 11. We're going to take a, take a pause from Hebrews where Brother Butch has had us and look at some of uh, Jesus' teaching on this matter of prayer. And this is such a familiar passage uh, on the subject of prayer that I wrestled with the Lord about this. You know, what in the world, Lord, is in your heart for my heart to try to convey, here's, here's one of the ways that Brother Butch and I, as we approach the preaching of the word, as our role as preachers um, is, is much like to be table waiters. We're a lot like table waiters. In other words, we go to the cook and whatever he's preparing, however he's seasoning it, However, he's presenting it on the, on the presentation. Um, our job, Brother Butch's job, Sunday by Sunday, and my job today is to go, is to go to the counter where the cook is, take the tray, 
and as best I possibly can bring it to the table in as much the same fashion as the cook prepared it. In other words, I might not even like the way it's, that needs to be moved over there and that needs to be salted and seasoned there. That's not preaching. Preaching is taking from the cook as best we can through frail, affected by the fall of humanity and presenting what's in the heart of the cook to those who will feast upon the bread of life. I don't know if I'll do that today, but that's our aim Sunday and Wednesday, and so this just kept circulating in me. It seems like the cook is cooking up something on this matter of prayer. So I didn't wrestle um, with it because believers in Christ, Christ followers, shouldn't be on heightened alert and reminded to stand firm in the place of prayer. We're always needing to be prompted and reminded to stand firm in the place of prayer. I mean, this world's a mess. I mean, even the Middle East this weekend is ramping up. And Alan Stoddard talked about that this weekend, that the world's a mess. Um, And so we know that we should pray, and we do pray. But oftentimes when we pray, our goal in prayer is to simply get something fixed or solved, to get an answer or a solution to a mess or a problem or even bring a legitimate need or desire before the Lord. Prayer has a lot of different goals, perhaps, um, but sometimes our goal in prayer can miss the mark because sometimes our goal in prayer is not the same as God's goal in prayer. You ever been there? Um, Let me be more personal and more to the point. Often my prayer (laughs) misses the mark because more often than I'd like to admit My goal in prayer is not the same as God's goal in my prayer. My goal may be just to get something from God. When God's goal in prayer may be that I might get God. So that's one of the reasons why I wrestled. Um, Another reason that I wrestled with it is because There are some intercessors in this room this morning, prayer warriors in this room this morning, that prayer is their calling. Uh, You probably don't even know who they are because they're hidden away in a closet of prayer in intercession for you and for I, um, for this church, for the nation, for the world. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking out at some faces that have probably forgotten more about prayer than I or we probably will ever really know. Um, So that's, I'm a little intimidated, I'm just saying. I'm a little intimidated. Another reason that I wrestled with the Lord about bringing this talk today is that prayer itself can seem very elusive and mysterious and ethereal. It's otherworldly. Wait, God's invisible, I'm physical and visible, and I'm supposed to be in communion with a, there's an elusive, mysterious aspect to prayer. Um, I mean, prayer is simply talking to God. It, It is that. Prayer is simply talking to God. But as we read the scriptures, that's on one hand. On the other hand, it can be overwhelming in its scope. Prayer can be overwhelming in its scope. I mean, you got the James 5.15, the prayer of faith. You got corporate prayer that's in Acts chapter 2. You got prayers of request, prayers of petition or supplication, prayers of thanksgiving. There's a prayer of worship in Acts chapter 13. There's the prayer of intercession in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and on and on and on and on. So it's simply talking to God, but it has so many different nuances in its scope. So this morning, whether you're a seasoned veteran in the practice or discipline of prayer, or you might even consider yourself a novice or a beginner in prayer, I believe that for both of those groups and all of us in between, 
I do believe the Lord may have something for us this morning in the matter of prayer that's found in Luke chapter 11. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. You know, that might be a great way to start a prayer. I mean, even before you, you start. I mean, he's going to give us a model, model sample prayer here to pray, but it might be okay to start out your prayer by saying, as you bow your head and close your eyes and fold your hands, you know, Lord, I, I need you to teach me to pray. Whether you're a novice or a veteran of prayer. And so could we just pause just for a minute and do that? Could we just do that so that whatever the cook has prepared in the kitchen might be delivered in as close a fashion as he prepared it that he might teach us to pray? Would you join me in, in that prayer this morning? Lord, we do. We pause and just say, in your mercy and grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you teach us to pray? Teach me, teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we're in uh, Luke chapter 11 in the first verse right there. It, the first thing that we notice, uh, it came to pass that as he was praying, so right off the bat, the number one thing that we notice right here is Jesus himself prayed. Jesus prayed. He didn't just teach on prayer. He didn't just talk about prayer. He didn't teach his, just teach his disciples to pray. Jesus prayed. The Son of Man, Son of God, fully God while in a human body, fully man, the Son of God, the Son of Man, back in the Gospels, fully human, fully God, he prayed. He, he prayed. And as the Son of God even today, not just in the Gospels, but even today, seated upon his throne, as Brother Butch just last month showed us in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, by Jesus, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus prayed, and Jesus prays. That's the first thing we notice. Next, when he ceased, when he ceased praying, and interestingly enough, because when I got there, I thought, that's an interesting phrase for the King James to say he ceased. When over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says we are to pray. That caught my attention. And it's interesting that that word is not the same. They're not the same word. Both of them New Testament Greek words. They're not the same words. When Jesus ceased, it's a different type of ceasing than Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians. Um, that's just a side note into Dave's world. Come back to the text. When he ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us. To pray as John also taught his disciples. The second thing we notice is prayer something that can be learned. Pr prayer something that can be learned. That should be encouraging to us if, if we're willing learners. When I was in elementary school, right around the corner from me, one block over was Johnson Park. It was a little baseball diamond and some teeter-totters and a merry-go-round that would kill elementary school kids today. <laughs> it was metal. There was no seat belts. There was a dirt path all the way around it because we'd put one rascal right in the middle of it and all of us would start running around and around and around and see if we could throw him off. You're, you're nodding your head because either you were the one who was running around or you were the one that got thrown off, one of the two. Well, as I was an elementary school kid, one of the one of the fads that kind of hit when I was growing up is, is people started getting, the, my friends started getting these little mini bikes, you know, little little lawnmower size engines on them, you know, <laughs> man, I want me a mini bike and my mom and dad in their wisdom, I mean, there were, 
no helmets, no, I mean, no shoes. I mean, it was crazy. But my friends would let me play. We didn't let me ride them anymore. And we were all over Johnson Park. Well, we went to family vacation in Morton, Mississippi at a state park. And one of my cousins or some, I don't even remember who it was, they had a little motorcycle. I said, well, I want to ride that. I ride those mini bikes back at the park. And my dad, in his wisdom, said, now, this is a little bit different here because you got this thing called a clutch. Got a pot, foot. And this will let you into a little bit of my world here. This, this will explain a lot. I know how to do it. <laughs> well, let me tell you, this is the break. and this is, I, I, I know how to do it. And my father, in his wisdom, said, oh. <laughs> and I take off. I pop that clutch, and I'm headed toward a grove of pine trees. <laughs> the pine trees were my break. I, I didn't get to the, but the pine trees were my break. That, <laughs> I know how to do it. I wasn't a willing, I wasn't willing to take just a few minutes and be teachable. Later when we had a daughter, yeah, y'all are reading ahead, you reap what you sow, I'm just saying. Prayer is something you can learn how to do if we will have a teachable heart. That ought to be encouraging to us. And he said, and uh, something we can learn. And then he said unto them, verse 2, when you pray, let's stop right there. Here's the third thing. The third thing we notice is when you pray, not if you pray, Jesus just assumes that his disciples are going to pray. When you pray, say, our Father and that's the fourth observation that we notice. We're praying to a father. Not, not some ether or some karma force or, or something in the ether. No, Jesus clearly identifies that we're speaking to a, a being and his beingness, not good grammar, but his beingness is that he's a father. Ten years ago now, uh, Anthony Brown and Pat Barrett wrote a song that Chris Tomlin recorded, and it's been all, it's hard to believe it's been ten years since this song came out. Um, it's sung all over the world. The second verse says, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you can provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. And you know the song, you're a good, good father. We're praying to a father. I want to be clear, Brother Butch would be clear about this as well. Not everyone has God as that father. Every, every human being is a created being of God. They know God is creator but only those who've received Jesus know him intimately as Father. John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own received him not, but as many received him to them, the ones who received him. He gave power to become sons of God. We receive him, and we become adopted into the family of God, and he becomes our father. We'll revisit that fatherhood piece in just a moment. When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We need to be remindful that he's father, and he has a holy name. He, he's an awesome and amazing father. The image that I have, some of you will remember this, Students, you may not remember this, but years ago when President John F. Kennedy was sitting behind the Resolute desk in the Oval Office, there's a photograph, black and white, of John Jr. 
sticking his head out underneath the resolute desk. The president of the United States taking on the cause of the country as it relates to the world and his child is playing underneath the resolute desk. We see, we see that we are children of a father who has awesome power and all authority. He has a holy name, consecrated, worthy to be revered. The next section, and I know we're just running through this, the next section is crucial to grasp the true nature of this elusive, mysterious, ethereal activity called prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, bring it to earth. In prayer, this is the sixth thing, in prayer we come with an attitude of submission. There's an attitude of surrendered submission. God has a kingdom, and one day it's coming in fullness. God has a will, and one day it's coming in completeness. It's going to be done in completeness. And we can ask now for that one day to come, to come soon. Come thy kingdom, be done thy will. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. But until that day, while we wait, while there's still suffering and sorrow and pain, we are to be the representatives of his kingdom. We are to be the expression of doing his will here on the earth. If I'm honest, sometimes my prayer, though I would not use, I would not use these words. I wouldn't say it. But if I'm honest, sometimes in the place of prayer, my prayer essentially is my heavenly Father, whose name is holy and worthy and wonderful, my will be done. My kingdom come. I wouldn't say it that way. But in contrast, our mindset in prayer should be, Father, you are in heaven and you have a kingdom and you have a will and I want my life to line up with your kingdom and I want my heart to line up with your will. Prayer, this may be for somebody this morning, prayer is not about changing God. Prayer is not about changing God. One of his goals with prayer is about changing me. Why why should I pray? Change my heart, oh God. Yeah, you can think. (laughs) That's that's why we, why should I pray? Because my heart needs to change. Give us this day, because now we shift. Give us this day our daily bread. The seventh thing we notice is he invites us to bring our needs, great or small, to him. Because he's our father and he cares for us, we can bring our needs to him, great or small. Our good, good, our good, good father cares for you and me about the things that are small or the things that are big. In prayer by faith, we can be open and transparent before God. In prayer, we can be completely open and transparent before God. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. In this model sample prayer, we know it's a model sample prayer because Jesus has never had to pray that sentence. I mean, as we forgive others, he did that part. But Jesus never had to pray, Father, forgive me, for I know not what I'm doing. Jesus never had to pray that prayer because Jesus has never sinned. Forgive us our sins. We know it's a model prayer because he's instructing us how 
to pray. Jesus saw our sin, became our sin, paid the price for our sin, satisfied the wrath of God against our sin, crucified, dead, buried, to show us that he was and is more powerful than our sin, death, and the grave. And so he rose again to show how forgiveness of sin takes place. Amen? This is the nitty-gritty of how the rubber meets the road with the aspect to prayer. And then finally, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, the evil one. You know that you have a, an enemy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not just somebody living in your house. It's not somebody living in the house next to you. It's not somebody on the other side of the world no, we have an enemy, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Lord, 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 deliver me from evil. So the ninth piece um, is that we can express to our God our need for his supernatural power and deliverance. Lord, deli set me free. Deliver me from evil. Now, I know that's a high level. We kind of hit that thing, the top of the trees, so to speak, really, really quickly. But I'd like to close this message in much the same fashion that Jesus closed this message. In verse 5, he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend... And she'll go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he shall, from within, he shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, my children are in bed, I can't rise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as much as he needeth. For those of you who are not King James fluent, importunity, I probably, you probably didn't use that word a lot last week. Importunity, it means persistence, especially to the point of annoyance. Think two-year-old. Somebody shows up at your house. Can I stay over? I'm sorry. You didn't know I was coming. Uh, can I stay over? You got anything to eat? It's late. Everybody in town's gone to bed. H-E-B's closed. I don't have anything to eat. But I got a friend who's next door. He's a great neighbor. Probably won't mind. Nobody wants to get a knock like that after midnight. Now, you or I, we'd probably get up because somebody knocking on the door at midnight, that's something's going on. But, but Jesus is making a point here saying, we're in bed. We'll have to wake everybody up. I know you're my friend, but well, let's do this in the morning. Go away. Now, the scripture's real clear. He said, they're friends, but just because they're friends, that's not motive enough for them, that person to get up. But there is a motive to get you out of bed at midnight. What might that motive be? Stop knocking on my door. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Don't make this story to mean something it doesn't mean or anything more than it means. Jesus' main point in this metaphor is there is power in persistent prayer. There is power in persistent prayer that does not give 
up. And this might be for somebody today. This may have your name on it. This statement right here may. You've been doing this. And you're not seeing anything. This, this sentence, this next sentence may be for somebody. It counts if you get to see the answer on the other side. It counts if you get to see the answer. Not here, but on the other side. It counts. Jesus wraps up. He says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. For everyone who asks receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall have bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone if he... Is ask a fish, will he give him, for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your father, to, to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? In prayer, ask him. Here Jesus returns, he bookends this prayer segment by starting with our Father who art in heaven, and he ends with an illustration about fathering and comparing earthly fathers to our heavenly Father. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? A fish, will he give him a serpent? An egg, will he give him a scorpion? I would imagine that in that room or in that field, but in this room maybe today, centuries ago and this very morning, that there would be some listening to that that would process that question in a different way than others. Another translation translates the question in verse 11, what father among you? What, what, what father? Am, you're a father here. Which one of you would do this? If they asked for bread, you'd give them a stone or a scorpion or a serpent. Some there and some here today. Which one of you, what father among you would do that? Some there and some here would say, would have to answer in metaphor, would have to answer. Mine did. I asked for bread and my father gave me a stone. Some there would have to say that. Some here would have to say that. Either by distance or by absence or performance orientation, or passivity, or by any number of different types of abuse or neglect or abandonment, on purpose or not. What father would give a serpent or a scorpion or a stone? Some there listening would say, well, mine did. When we as disciples asked Jesus to teach us to pray, one of the barriers perhaps one of the most significant barriers to prayer, to you and I praying, can be our distorted view of who God is. Let me say it a different way. If we really knew who he was, who he is, and what he's like, we would pray. But one of the barriers to our going to God in prayer can be our distorted view of who he is. And when somebody in the room hears me say, who we pray into, we pray to our Father, a, bar a, a barrier can go up. May I say to those Christ followers in the room who may fall into that group, 
you feel up? I'm, I'm in that group. Or maybe as a father yourself, you feel the weight that I was one, I am one. I missed my chance and I didn't do it right. And I'm one of those who provided a distorted view. E either one of those groups. May I just speak this over you this morning? Because this will be a word for somebody this morning as well. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. In every way that you may have had a wonderful but yet imperfect because there aren't any perfect human fathers. There aren't any of those. In every way that you may have had or you yourself are a wonderful father, all of those wonderful ways are intended to be a faint, a faint whisper of how infinitely more wonderful your Abba Father is. And every way that you may have had or maybe you yourself were or I was distant or absent, in all of those imperfect ways, God can use those and turn those ways as a vivid image to show this is not what your Abba Father is like. In all the good ways that your father was, it's, it's just a little whisper of how infinitely good your Abba Father is. And in every way that your father failed you or you as a father failed is to be a vivid picture. You know what? Your Abba Father is not like that. Jesus came to show us what the Father is truly like. In John 14, 9, Jesus said, He who hath seen me has seen the Father. You want to know what Abba Father looks like? <laughs> Just look at Jesus. He is the express image, according to Hebrews 7. He's the express image of who God the Father is. He's the perfect picture. As Larnell and Sandy used to sing about 40 years ago. Mike, Renee, can you believe it's 40 years ago? 40 years ago, Larnell Harris and Sandy Patty. He's more than wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He's everything that my soul ever longed for. He's everything he promised and so much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is. That's what Jesus is to me. Our goal in prayer may not be the same goal in prayer as God's always. Are we willing, whether we are a veteran or a novice, for Jesus to teach us how to pray? And when we pray, is our posture one of submission? Your kingdom, not my kingdom. Your will, not my will. Are we hoping to change God or are we hopeful that God will change, change me? Are we convinced that he knows best? He cares about our needs more than we care about our needs. We can trust him. When we pray, are we open and honest completely with him? Not, you know, nothing surprises God. You and I can't tell him anything. He doesn't already know. 
And when we pray, are we receiving from him, depending upon him for his grace and strength to withstand and escape temptation and the evil one when he comes to devour? And when we pray, can we let it in that he is a good, good father who can be trusted? Today, the first prayer some of you may ever pray, legitimate prayer you may ever pray is, you know what, I, I don't know Jesus as Lord. He's, God's not my father, but I want him to be my father. Today in this invitation, in just a few moments, you can come and respond to this invitation and say, I need to be say, I need to be adopted by that father. I need Jesus in salvation. Maybe as a child of God, you know Jesus, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. You can respond to this invitation in just a moment and come and say, you know what, I want to, next time, David, you put on those, those Magellan pants and get in the baptistry there, I want to follow, I want to be obedient to follow the Lord's uh, command to be baptized. Or maybe you've been visiting the country church, you've been around here for a while, and you sense the Lord's calling me to be part of the country church. And during this invitation, you can come, take me by the hand, and uh, we, if the Lord's drawing you, then we will receive you. Teach us to pray, Lord. Teach us to pray. If the Lord's spoken something into your heart in that regard, would you just, even as we sing, would you yield yourself before the Lord? The altar is open on both sides, these altar benches, to, if you need to pray or if you feel like you just need to remain seated and pray right there. In a, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Your certain place can be that green chair you're sitting in right now. So would you stand together with me as Paul leads us in this hymn of invitation and would you respond as the Lord gives you prompting? Just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed
Jesus. Mm-hmm.